I love movies, and anyone who's watched this channel long enough can tell. I've always enjoyed them, as well as the making of various movies to find out how they got made. But of all the years I've been on YouTube, I'm surprised I've never made a top 10 list of my favorite movies. So, for this long overdue video, I'm going to set up some rules. If the movie is part of a franchise, I'm going to pick the best to that franchise to make room for other movies. And the other is that if it's an adaptation, I'm only going to pick the best movie version. So without further ado, here are my top 10 favorite movies of all time. Number 10. Silver Lines Playbook Bradley Cooper's character is one of the most likable protagonists I've ever seen in a movie. His positive attitude is so contagious they just can't help but root for him. But he also has mental problems he tries to overcome, as well as trying to rebuild a life they once had. I also love Jennifer Lawrence's character who also has their own mental problems to sort out, but I also like her mild cynical attitude as a nice counterbalance to Cooper's character. I also really like the rest of the characters that are likable, but relatable, as if you know them personally. It's a sweet movie that is not afraid to get sad, but it's also unapologetically up uplifting at the same time. Number 9 LA Confidential. This movie is retro in the right ways by feeling like a classic crime drama from the 1950s, but it has the mature edginess of the 1990s. The ensemble cast is perfectly played, and each actor does a great job at playing characters you would typically see in movies of the time. I also like the movie is very Hollywood in its presentation, but like the real Hollywood, or at least the broader sense Los Angeles, it has a dark and corrupt underbelly. It has a lot of well-directed action, an excellent story with some very good twists and turns, and some great dialogue. Who in the hell are you? Goes to Christmas past. Maybe I will. Maybe I won't. The late PD shit, Bert. Get the fuck out of here or I'll call your wife to come get you. A hooker cut to look like Lana Turner is still a hooker. Hey! She just looks like Lana Turner. She is Lana Turner. What? She is Lana Turner. Number eight. 500 Days of Summer. A big reason why I love this movie is that it has the most realistic portrayal of a romance in any movie. Much of that is attributed to the writer's real life experience, with the majority of what is shown in the movie really happening to the point of it being autobiographical. What also makes the romantic scenes work is the great chemistry between Joseph Gordon Levitt and Zoe Deschanel. Since they have known each other since childhood, they are so natural around each other and can sell a romance easily. I also love the music video as scenes portray the character's emotions that can make the audience feel a variety of things. I also like the idea that not only are the things you love worth pursuing, but we should also stop living up to the mythical standards of love, or at least how the media betrays it. It's, it's these cards, and the movies and the pop songs, they're to blame for all the lies, and the heartache, everything. And we're responsible. I'm responsible. Number 7. The 1985 version of Fright Night. Similar to LA Confidential, it is retro in a sense, as well as being contemporary for its time. I do like how it takes itself seriously with the rules of vampires, but also has a lot of fun with its premise. I love how the pacing is slow at first, but as the movie keeps going, it gradually picks up speed. It gradually reveals its hand when it comes to special effects to where it unleashes itself in the third act in more than a satisfying way. The movie is also an allegory for standing up to bullies, and that they will not stop unless you stand up to them. The character that perfectly shows shows this is Peter Vincent. He's a fraud and a coward, but being inspired by the heroics of a fan of his, he finds the courage within himself. It's serious and fun in all the right ways. Plus, it has an excellent synth soundtrack by Brad Fiedel. Number 6. The Iron Giant. It's a kid's movie on the surface, but surprisingly deep that every age group can enjoy. I love the friendship that Hogarth has with the Iron Giant, not just for having fun, but to teach him right from wrong, as well as the Iron Giant going against his programming for being a destructive weapon and choosing his free will to help others. I am not a gun. The title character of the movie does one of the most heroic things that easily is one of the saddest things I've ever seen in a movie, and in a way I objectively see it as the best Superman movie ever made. But about Kent Mansley, remember how I said that the protagonist in Silver Lion's playbook was so likable? Well, Kent Mansley is one of the most dislikable antagonists I've ever seen. He is such an out-of-touch government worker who will double down, triple down, and quadruple down just to come out on top, no matter what happens to other people. That missile is targeted to the giant's current position! Where's the giant, Mansley? <laughs> It's a beautifully animated movie that perfectly captures the 1950s, but it also feels timeless at the same time. Number 5. 
The Terminator. This has to be my favorite science fiction movie of all time. It also was an important movie that I watched during adolescence since it fascinated me how they made such an impressive movie with so little money. It is a slasher movie with a science fiction edge, but it also has core as a love story. Linda Hamilton and Michael Bean are great together at first as a waitress and a protector, to something more. I like how Sarah Connor has a character arc going from an average woman to a vigilant warrior at the end, but with the tragedy of losing the man that she loved. I also love Kyle Reese the character who is hardened because of the dystopian future he comes from, but has feelings for Sarah Connor that makes sense why he went back in time. I came across time for you, Sarah. I love you. It is a great contrast to the imposing T-800 that became iconic by Arnold Schwarzenegger. Because of Arnold's lack of acting experience, his robotic mannerisms come to his advantage, and his imposing size also conveys a nearly unstoppable menace. I know a lot of people prefer its sequel, and it's a great movie, but this one just feels more like a unique movie that left such an impact on me. Number 4 Batman Mask of the Phantasm. There are several Batman movies that I think are great, but this is my favorite. Part of the reason why I love it is that it's connected to Batman the Animated Series, which is my favorite TV show of all time. But there is more to that. I love how it dwells into Bruce Wayne's past, and how he almost had a normal and happy life with another woman. But like the gothic tragedy that it is, it does not work out, and they ironically follow similar paths. The moment when Bruce puts on the Batman mask for the first time always gives me chills, and it's one of my favorite moments in a Batman movie. What also gives me chills is the soundtrack by Shirley Walker, whose work easily rivals that of Danny Elfman and Hans Zimmer. Another standout character is the Joker, who is not shoehorned into the movie, but has an important part in the mystery of who the Phantasm is. Unlike many Batman movies that tend to gloss over or don't touch upon Batman's detective skills, this movie has Batman trying to solve a murder mystery. Unlike other live-action Batman movies that feel the need to have a city-ending climax to have Gotham City in peril, this movie does not have that cliché because it's a personal story of Batman slash Bruce Wayne. Many at least consider it to be one of the best Batman movies ever made, but I think it's the best Batman movie of all time. Number 3 is a tie between the 1931 version of Dracula and Bram Stoker's Dracula from 1992. Each are adaptations of the book of the same name, but go about it in different ways. The 1931 version is more of a conventional horror movie that does follow the more so popular stage version at the time, while the 1992 version tries to stay closer to the source material. They are both technically impressive movies with unique cinematography. The 1931 version does have scenes that characters describe things that the audience does not see, but it is in touch with the shifting perspectives of the book. The 1992 version does show a lot more, while also being highly artistic, especially for one of the greatest directors of all time. Bela Lugosi was phenomenal as a charming count, but as a cold killer to those who know he is a vampire. Gary Oldman also did a great job of portraying an evil vampire, but as someone who is lovesick, and as core wants redemption. Whether you like a conventional horror movie, or something more of a grandiose gothic romance, you can't go wrong with either one. Children of the night. What music they make. The children of the night. <laughs> what sweet music they make. Number two. Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. This is not only my favorite Disney movie, but my favorite animated movie of all time. It is also the first movie I remember re-watching multiple times as a kid. I think it's a perfect balance of having the fun and family-friendly elements one expects in a Disney movie, but it's also not afraid to get dark and sad at times. The Seven Dwarf characters are hilarious, and have a unique chemistry that is almost unmatched. I also love Snow White, who is sort of a motherly figure who teaches the dwarfs responsibility, as well as being a kind and beautiful soul that is impossible to hate. That, of course, is the opposite of the movie's villain. Aside from being vain, the evil queen is deceptive, and showing how evil people will take advantage of kind and naive people is a good cautionary tale for anyone to watch. It also has an impressive art style that merges German artistry that keep itself connected to its fairy tale roots, while also having an American animation style that people have come to associate with Disney animation. It is a lovely movie that any age group can enjoy, and it's a timeless classic, as opposed to what some people may say. There is a big focus on her love story um, with a guy who literally stalks her. <laughs> yeah. Weird. Weird. <laughs> 
and my number one favorite movie of all time is the 1999 remake of The Mummy. I do like the original movie with Boris Karloff, but this remake took the basic premise of that story and not only greatly expanded upon it, but also gave it its own identity. It is a perfect balance of several different genres. It's an action adventure movie with elements of horror, comedy, and romance. The soundtrack was masterfully done by Jerry Goldsmith, and its soundtrack captures what the audience should feel with the various genre shifts. Brendan Fraser and Rachel Weisz are perfect in this movie, not just in their acting, but their on-screen chemistry. They complement each other where Rick is unapologetically masculine, just as much as Evelyn is unapologetically feminine. I also like how we get to know some of the other characters for a good chunk of the movie, to where their deaths are impactful when they die. Imhotep is a great movie villain who is not only a credible threat, but an imposing enemy that gets more powerful as the story progresses. This movie is filled with so much spectacle with a lot of impressive effects that are great for its time, especially the graphic details on Imhotep early on. There is also no shortage of comedy from various characters, the best being from Benny, whose abuse is hilarious because he is the ultimate weasel. Pish cash a lot. What did you say? I don't want to tell you. You just hurt me some more. <laughs> I love this movie now, just as much as I did when I was a kid. It's a movie that never gets old, and it's the kind of movie that always makes me feel happy. Speaking of that movie, here's a word from someone who was in it. Hi, this is Corey Johnson. I played Mr. Daniels in The Mummy, and uh, I'm sitting backstage in my dressing room uh, in London and just thinking about how many people who were on the movie who I'm still in touch with. Uh, Oded Fair is one of my best friends. I worked with John Hanna a few years ago, and we all we did was talk about the time we had on The Mummy. Uh, I chat with Arnold Vosloo every once in a while. I work with Brendan Fraser and Batgirl, and I literally told him, you have no idea what it's like to look across the set and see that it's you I'm working with again. And um, oddly, on the street in New Orleans, I ran into Stephen Summers, who was the director and writer of The Mummy, who was the man responsible for the whole thing. Anyway, I think what makes it special is that we're all still somehow tied together 25 years after the movie was made. So, anyway... Happy 25th anniversary to The Mummy. And that movie is covered in my book, 100 Years of Universal Monster Movies. Order your copy today, available in print and digital. So anyway, thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe.